So an RDL, or Romanian deadlift, I think should start from the top. We're not weightlifters. We're not actually just trying to get certain positions going and, and uh, practicing that. The RDL is used so that we have an eccentric and a concentric. And so it starts the same way that a bench or a squat does with initiating with an eccentric. Okay? It also emphasizes hip extension and doesn't force you to get into a range of motion where you're actually putting your lumbar at risk as much as you would with a deadlift where you have to pull it off the floor regardless of how tall you are or how long your femurs are or how short your arms are, et cetera, et cetera. However, people are awful at just hip hinging and they are really terrible at RDLs. And there's a specific skill set you need to teach someone how to do an RDL. And I've actually, there's a time point where I had bodybuilders doing RDLs and I was like, oh, you know, let's take a review of your lifts. And I'd have like pro level bodybuilders send me a video of an RDL and I would just be like, oh my God, what are you doing? And it would be awful and we'd have to actually go through teaching it. So often mis misperformed. Um, Often people are doing stiff leg deadlifts or they end up squatting it. But first I'm just going to show you what an RDL should look like and then I'll talk you through all the things that I'm doing that differentiate it between all the other kind of hybrid movements that you'll see. So the RDL starts in the rack at a height where you could deadlift it out. So this is too high. Thank you, sir. I don't know if you're messing with me or not. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, basic same grip position as you would on just the top of a deadlift. When you have the RDL, you stand nice and straight. Just everything you would have at lockout of the deadlift. And you're initiating by pushing your hips backwards. Your weight should be in your heels, and you want to keep your lats tight the whole time. So the same way you pull the slack out of the bar and get your chest up, you're going to try to maintain that position throughout. Okay. And the thing you want to think is, is butt back. You let the knees unlock, but you're not bending at the knees downward. So knees unlock, butt back, and you're going to go until the movement gets isolated to your lumbar. Now I want you to tell me when the only thing you see moving is my lumbar. Yep, that is my range of motion. So next time you see a bodybuilder go drag out three plyo boxes and stand in front of them to say, i got to get the stretch, you know. That's fine if they're trying to train their lumbar, or if they're trying to maybe like a Chinese weightlifter actually working into flexion of the lumbar. That's fine, lightweight, protective. I can see an argument. If you're trying to load the hamstring and the glutes, what do the hamstrings and glutes do together? Hip extension. So we're trying to focus on hip extension. Yes, you're also gonna get lumbar from that, but that's not necessarily the goal. There's probably better movements we can use to train the lumbar in isolation if we want to. All right, now, what people often will do incorrectly is they will let their knees travel forward, which takes tension off the hamstring. That is different than that, right? They'll squat it a little bit, or they'll let the bar drift away from their body and get out here, okay? Now there's a few ways you can cue this so that someone actually gets this. The easiest way is just to block the knees. So for example, can't feel my feet there. Can I use this bench real quick? Sorry to take your seat. If someone just wants to get the pattern, just block their knees and just tell them, push your butt back. And you'll see this moment of like motor pattern confusion when they can't figure it out and they do this and they finally like goes, just let your butt go back and they go, oh, I get it. Now they may still try to squat it. And there's a way to fix that too. But just focusing on pushing the butt back. Blocking the knees is a really useful tool for that. Another one, if they're having trouble putting their butt back instead of down, if they're squatting, is get them to go up to a wall. We'll pretend this is a wall. So have them go roughly about a foot's distance, right? Which is still about equal to this. Turn around, and then tell them, all right, keep your back straight. Try to touch your butt to the wall. Push back, push back, push back. And they can even reach forward, counterbalance, it'll help them. And they go, oh, I feel it. And then when they do that, because you're giving them an external cue, they're probably going to be better at it than all the stuff you're telling them normally. That's a really good RDL position. You're going to feel a big stretch in your hamstrings, and right back up. Okay? Another thing is you see lumbar rounding. Your stick. Can I have it? My man. It wasn't just for beating up ninjas on the tube. It's also for instructing form. Having two-point contact. You can do this with yourself, or you can just hold it there for your client. One hand goes in the lumbar, one behind the head. Actually, three-point contact. You want sacrum, upper back, and head. Okay. Then the same thing, push the butt back. And they want to try to keep all that in line. 
that can really help them nail that RDL form. I have literally had to do all three of these things simultaneously, or two at least. Block the knees, keep this position, and just push your butt back, weight in your heels to get someone to figure this out, okay? But it's a very effective combination of tools, and I guarantee you they'll actually learn how to do it. Most people just have more range of motion than they think they need to, and they let it get out in front of them, okay? We're not trying, like I was actually talking to this gentleman about this, but the stiff-legged deadlift, the version where you're just doing this, I think is probably emphasizing damage too much. So we've talked, you guys have, who've heard any of us talk, we talk about different mechanisms and determinants of hypertrophy. Damage seems to be related to hypertrophy. And at long muscle lengths, when you contract and you do an eccentric, those two things combined will definitely elevate damage. A lot of bodybuilders do the stiff-legged movements. They go, it wrecks me up the next day, man. It's like, well, I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing. What if I want you to train in a couple days? What if I want you to have a frequency of three times a week per legs and you're sore for four days because you did three sets of heavy stiff leg deadlifts with max range and max weight to failure? So it's really just kind of getting the cart before the horse. I do think, you know, eccentric hamstring training can be useful to prevent injury, but that's not the type of thing you take to failure use as an overload exercise, okay? So anyway, getting a little off topic. So that's really all I got for the RDL. I want to make sure everyone can properly hip hinge. Just to go over it one more time, the key points are start in the rack. So you can have an eccentric, get yourself into a starting position, tighten the lats, same thing you'd be at in the position at the top position of a deadlift, push the butt back, don't let the knees travel forward at all. Your range of motion is as soon as your back is the only part moving, so right there. Now if you want to train your lumbar more, you can go full range of motion as long as you can keep your, your back flat. If you just want to know that that final range of motion is just lumbar, that's fine. Okay, And then teaching tools we have. Keep the spine neutral, to prevent the knees traveling forward, and to give them an external cue to reach with their butt. Okay? Try all three. Play with them. If you struggle, I'll try to have you do them. We can break them into groups. I don't think you need to go heavy here. We can have one here, one here, and even just someone holding the ninja stick. Cool? All right, let's do it.